Hello, welcome. I'm seeing people trickling in. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is normally the part where I'd welcome you to the museum, but I think instead I'm welcoming you to my guest bedroom. So, um, but welcome to what is our first uh, virtual public program. Um, my name is Greg Stewart. I am the coordinator of adult public programs um, and a museum educator here. And I'm so excited to be joined by Sarah Mastrangelo, our um, fellow in paintings conservation. Um, you'll also see we have Linnea West on the screen, who is our manager of adult public programs. She's gonna be helping us out uh, today with, with the um, chat feature and stuff like that. Um, so I'm, today I'm just so excited to be able to offer you a glimpse into our paintings conservation studio with Sarah um, to really get a look at a project that she's been working on uh, to conserve two portraits of the former emperor and empress of Mexico. These will both be on view in the spring when we reopen our early American galleries. Um, and in the past, these galleries have often you know, kind of given us, you know, fairly traditional looks at things like Philly history and the founding fathers. Um, but this installation is going to give us a chance to sell some, tell some new stories like what you're hearing today. Um, and, and so in, in some ways, this is still that story of Philadelphia that we like to tell in our galleries. But um, you'll see there's a lot of connections between Philly and the history of Mexican independence. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But really, I think this is a great chance to get a better idea of what a conservator like Sarah does. Um, this is a job that's part art and part science and just really cool, as you'll see. Um, so before we get into it, um, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping stuff. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with Zoom. This will seem uh, familiar to you, I hope. Um, we are recording this program. And this will be um, sent to you uh, as a recording in an email to that we'll follow up with. So, so you'll be able to watch this after the fact. Um, it will be about 45 minutes, roughly, of presentation and then time for questions. Um, and you'll see there should be a little closed caption um, button at the bottom of your screen. So we are closed captioning today. So um, thank you, Brandis, for being our captioner. Um, and I will say that we're in webinar mode, so you may notice that your screen is muted and your sound is turned off, but you will be able to answer, ask questions using the Q&A feature um, that's also in Zoom. Um, and you'll see there's comment section too, and Linnea will be um, dropping helpful links in the comments for us as we go. Um, but she'll also be monitoring both areas when it's time for questions. Um, and then just some other Zoom features to be aware of. You'll see there's a slider bar that kind of goes between the presentation screen and the, the camera view. So you can move that back and forth to see something bigger or smaller if you want, if you just grab that slider bar with your mouse. Um, and there's also, usually on your, it'll be on the top right screen, there's a view icon where you can change the view between grid and speaker view. Um, I'd recommend speaker view for this program since Sarah's going to share her camera. That's why we have a second um, presentation camera, if you see that, um, to show us around the, the studio here. Um, and you can also zoom on in the screen if you want to see a particular detail. So Zoom has that feature. Um, so I think that is about it for me. Um, so I'm just going to start and welcome Sarah back. And I think before we get into talking about the two works that she's been conserving, I just think it'd be great if Sarah, if you could tell us a little bit about your job as a fellow in paintings conservation and kind of how you were able to, um, how, how you got there, how you got to this career. Sure, absolutely. Um, so. A conservator, as a conservator, I'm interested in the preservation of cultural heritage for future generations. Um, so here at the museum, we actually have a fairly good sized conservation department. And within the department, we have uh, people who specialize in paintings conservation, furniture conservation, uh, objects, textile and costume. Uh, we have our scientific department. 
and um, we have a framer, a conservation framer. So we have a lot here within the department itself where we care for the collection. So I learned about conservation when I was nearing the end of my undergraduate degree. I was studying art conservation, I'm sorry, I was studying art history as well as visual arts. So I was uh, studying painting and graphic design as well. And um, when I studied abroad, I had a professor who was a conservator and was teaching a course. And that is when I first heard of it as a profession. And I was like, this is amazing because I've always loved, you know, science. I love hands-on work. I love painting. I love art history. And this is just the perfect combination for me. And so I finished my undergraduate degree and realized very quickly <laughs> that you need chemistry. There's a lot of chemistry requirements. So I went back to school and got those requirements under my belt. And then I also had to do quite a bit of pre-program experience at other uh, institutions where you get hands-on experience in the field. And then after that, I was able to apply to grad school. And so I went to New York uh, University Institute of Fine Arts, and I graduated in 2018 with my degree in conservation. So in my last year of graduate school, I actually was able to intern here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And then I continued on as a fellow for the last two years. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so one of the things that I think it's great about being able to do programs virtually is we really get a chance to see spaces that um, the general public generally isn't allowed into. So I'm wondering, Sarah, if you could just give us a quick tour of the paintings conservation studio. And mm -hmm. we're going to switch to your screen now. So, so hopefully you should appear larger for folks once we switch here. Okay. So I'm just switching my screen around on my phone. So as you know, as, as Greg said, we're in the conservation studio. And this is our paintings conservation studio. And I'm just going to zoom around a bit. So we have quite a lot of wonderful projects in the studio right now, two of which are for the American reinstall. So for example, I'm just pointing right here to this boy with parrot. That's one painting that will be conserved and treated and be in the reinstall in the spring. And then another one which you might, you know, see in the background there is the staircase group, the frame to the staircase group, Peel Staircase Group, which my colleague Lucia Bai is working on. And it's going to be an incredible treatment that I'm sure there will be wonderful public programming on in the future. It's actually here, face down, currently undergoing treatment. We have um, a photo studio back there. And of course, we have some frames. There's some frame projects going on right now for the American Reinstall as well. So the studio is very much well, uh, well equipped, excuse me. We have a microscope, a table microscope right there so we can do our work or if we have to take cross sections or look at something under the microscope. And we have other amenities um, such as the fume hood, which you see here. So we're able to work with solvents very carefully. We also have very good fume extraction um, within the studio space itself. So we're able to work with solvents at the easel and make sure um, we are being safe with what we do. Just turn nice. back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Welcome back. Um, so I think now we can definitely dive into the two portraits you've been working on. Um, uh, recently, these are portraits of Ana Maria and Augustine de Iturbide who were for uh, a very brief time, and we'll talk more about this, the Empress and Emperor of Mexico, um, respectively. So uh, I'm curious, what does the kind of preliminary work you did reveal about their lives and, and some of their history up to the time that these portraits were made? Absolutely. So I'm just going to go ahead and share the presentation right now. So, sorry, I have two screens going right now, so I need to stop sharing my video. <laughs> there we go. Okay. 
How's that? Can we see it? <laughs> Looks great. Yep. All right. Excellent. All right. So these two figures, as Greg's mentioned, these, this is the Emperor and Empress Iturbide of Mexico, the first Mexican empire. Now, I can't go in depth into the history of Mexican independence right now because it is, as you can imagine, a very complicated, complex story with so many figures, so many um, characters, so many events happening. Um, so I'm going to have to be very brief and just highlighting a few details here and there. But first, I just want to tell you a bit about the couple themselves. So Ana Maria and Agustin, they came from very wealthy um, prominent families in Mexico. Uh, Augustine himself, he actually was a descendant of Basque um, nobility and his, uh, on one side and on the other side, they owned land and so they were very wealthy. The same thing with Ana Maria, she came, she had some nobility in her family as well and they also owned, they were wealthy business people. And so they had met in a college and it, they were considered a perfect match for each other. And so they were about, I think she was 19, he was like 22 when they got married. They ended up having 10 children together, um, both very forceful characters, very um, powerful figures, even like well before everything starts to uh, go forward. So if we just focus on Iturbide's military career, he started out as a lieutenant uh, for Mexico, well, actually fighting for the royalists. So he was fighting in support of keeping the monarchy in charge of Mexico. In about 1810, the Mexican War for Independence breaks out. And Iturbide is definitely fighting for the royalists. But Iturbide was quite an opportunist. And while he very much wanted to see the monarchy maintaining power, by about 1820, because of series of events, uh, political events and changes in Spain, we see a political vacuum occur in Mexico. And so there's this unrest, of course, and the, the, um, the nobility in Mexico is like, okay, well, there might be an opportunity here. And so in fear of a Republican tide, he decides to actually cooperate with the insurgents and, as, and becomes the leader of the of the army of the three guarantees, which the three guarantees being the royalists, um, the insurgents, and then uh, religion, so Catholicism in Mexico. And so he is the leader, they come together, they march on Mexico City and basically declare independence um, in September of 21, 1821. And so by 1822, after a series of other events, which are complicated and, and would be too much to talk about right now, he basically um, is declared emperor. And so these, of course, are their coronation portraits. Is it progressing? Okay. <laughs> So, as I mentioned, the, the, this painting on the left is the triumphant entrance of the, um, the army of the three guarantees in Mexico City. And on the right is, I'm sorry, we're having some technical difficulties over here. Okay, here, here we are. And so on the right, we have the coronation, a uh, depiction of the coronation of Augustine de Turbide in 1822. So I just wanted to include a couple other sets of portraits of the coronation portraits of the Turbides. And you can see, um, obviously, close linkage just to what we have here, and then some differences. The most key thing to notice is that there's that these portraits are really drawing upon Napoleon's uh, image of power and as a, the portrait of the emperor, and so they're a direct allusion to those that, to that painting in, in the just what they're wearing. So. The history and everything we could go a lot more in depth into, but we're gonna kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about what I do, 
um, when I receive a project. So basically, we receive a project, we look into the history, we see what's going on, but we really focus on what's happening in the paintings themselves. We start with an examination just of the paintings with our eyes. And that's like one of the most important things is what you can see with your eyes. Because you can tell a lot just starting there, even before we get technical, before we get to the microscope, before we get to the imaging. And so just looking at them, it's very clear that they're overpainted and there's there's a lot going on on the surface. They're discolored, there's overpaint, and um, we can definitely work with these to make them better in their appearance. But once we move past just the examination and looking at the surface, we move to the microscope, we see what's happening on a very close scale. And then after that, we kind of want to dive deeper. We want to you know, penetrate the paint layers and see what's happening underneath. So I just wanna show a detail here. This is the bottom left corner of Anna Maria's portrait. And you can see that there is a signature here. It's kind of a bit brighter around it because it had been clean, but around that is quite this mushy, dark, discolored mess of overpaint. Using a technique called infrared reflectography, we're able to kind of get rid of the visual noise and concentrate on the signature itself. So infrared reflectography basically is an imaging technique that takes the electromagnetic spectrum, so basically, you know, wavelengths of energy and concentrating in the, in the IR wavelength category. And, it base, and then we're able to kind of dive deep and see past the upper layers. So reflected back to us is carbon, for example, and that's what we can see in the signature. So as it's basically the IR uh, infrared setup, it's just like, it's a camera that you're kind of shooting at the painting and you just kind of go along the surface. And as you're going along, uh, as we were going along, what we noticed was this face in the stomach of Ana Maria. And I was super excited because I was like, wait, are these eyes? What's happening here? It's right in her stomach. And I kind of mused to myself, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, she was pregnant so many times, maybe it's, it's, you know, just joking. It's a baby inside, but no, no. But in either case, there's a face underneath. And in order to get more information, we can dive a little bit deeper using x-radiography. And so here we see the x-rays and so much more is revealed. I'm gonna let it sit on the screen for a moment just to let your eye wander around and just kind of absorb this, this what's happening. So with my pointer, I'm just showing here again, that's the face we saw in infrared. Now using the X-ray, we see so much more. What we see are two fully finished portraits underneath the portraits that we see on top. And what's really interesting is that on the portrait of uh, Augustine, he actually, there's actually three portraits. So you have the portrait here of Iturbide, and then there's a female portrait actually right next to that. And then flipped 180 is this portrait underneath. So we take that x-ray and we turn it around or upside down. <laughs> and we isolate the figure underneath using Photoshop just to bring out the characteristics so we can really see what's going on. And we start looking at the features of this figure underneath. Here's just a detail of the face. And, and these characteristics, they're very, they're very particular. And in doing research and looking at portraits in Spain at this time, and if you're very much aware of <laughs> portraiture, but more importantly, famous royal people, <laughs> it becomes very clear who this is. So using an overlay in Photoshop, you basically have an exact match to this portrait of Charles IV by Goya. Now, before you get too excited, do we think we have a Goya under these, these Turbidae portraits? 
No, not necessarily. And that's because there are a ton of images, a ton of portraits, very similar in style by Goya and his circle of contemporary artists um, that were kind of dispersed throughout the country, throughout the kingdom. Now what's nice seeing these portraits side by side is that you can tell that the artist um, who is Duarte, he had kind of, like if we remember, recall those portraits that I showed you of the coronation of the Eternities earlier, there was a lot happening in the background. Now if you look at this portrait, there's nothing really happening in the background. And that's because he's kind of drawing on this, you know, uh, actually on the paint, from the paintings underneath. So this idea of reusing material is not new. I mean, yes, these materials are expensive. Um, you have the canvas, you have someone new in power, you're gonna reuse it in order to supersede the old uh, image of authority with this new image of authority. That's a common practice seen throughout history. Even if we go back to the time of the pharaohs, pharaohs in Egypt were doing the same thing. They would take this image of the preceding pharaoh, alter it, and it's now their image. Now this is a bit different in that they, you know, a, a ground, another ground layer was put down and it's fully repainted. But this idea of co-opting authority is really fascinating. And so drawing upon um, this precedent of Charles IV is seen in other artworks depicting, um, for example, this allegory of um, the rule of Iturbide and Charles IV. There's a lot of similarities there. Again, borrowing from Napoleon, borrowing from Charles IV to cement his own power. So the same is true with Ana Maria. So if we just do a little overlay here of another portrait of her, there's pretty much a very good match. And there are many examples of her portrait as well. So I bring these portraits, I want to show you them side by side, and I want to kind of point out the sashes underneath. So there's one here, and there's one here on uh, Maria Luisa di Parma. And so looking at these sashes, we can actually kind of hone in on a date, because these sashes, um, they symbolized um, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, like a, sorry, I forget the term. My brain just went blank for a second. Sorry about that. But <laughs> so basically in eight and sorry, 1792, the design of the sash, particularly for Maria Luisa, it changed from a very bland one colored sash to a three colored sash or, a, you know, a three striped sash where you have purple on the outside and a white stripe in the middle. Inspired by that, the, the order of Charles III, which is the sash that um, Charles IV is wearing, was just again a plain sash and he had it changed to a three part sash. So you have blue on the outside and a white stripe in the middle for the order of Charles III. That doesn't become official until 1804, but you do see this depicted in other portraits of Charles IV um, by like 1800 and not really prior to that. So the idea of dating these, we could probably say it's around 1800 that these portraits underneath were painted. And no later than 1808, of course, when um, Ferdinand, or sorry, when um, Ferdinand has to abdicate the throne. So yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I think that's, I, I love this, I mean, it's such an amazing discovery that you were able to make underneath those portraits. Um, but I, I, I love that this isn't the whole part of the story, right? Because we then have to talk about what happens after the coronation. Um, and I know that from talking with you that the, the framing was specifically significant um, in, in your decisions uh, based on Anna Maria's life in particular after this moment. 
Yeah, definitely. It, the frame aspect of this project was one of the, was super interesting to me because it's something I've not had to really consider prior to this project. Um, and so before we really talk about the frames, we gotta kinda, we gotta think about the portraits post um, the coronation and just talk more about the Eterbides and what happens to them. So the Eterbides are in power as emperor and empress for basically a year before they are ousted or put, sent into exile to Italy. And then they're in Italy for a little bit in Livorno, and then they're kind of kicked out of Livorno and they go to Britain. And they're there for a bit. When they're there, Eternity kind of gets word that, you know, politically things aren't going so great with this new government that's in power in Mexico. And supporters are saying, if you come back, you might be able to offer your services, i.e. take over again. So lured by this, he goes back to Mexico. And unfortunately, with being on Mexico's soil for about five days, he is executed. This is a depiction of that uh, period or that time, the execution. And then on the left, we see actually his manifesto. So he had written a manifesto and he held it in his breast pocket and that is his blood spattered all over it. So Ana Maria is left. She's got, you know, children who have some of them older, some of them, you know, younger, but they're far flung and she has to leave Mexico. She's not allowed to stay there. Where does she go? What does she do? So basically her and two of her daughters and a companion, a priest companion, they have to leave Mexico. So they get on the ship and they sail up to Louisiana. They're there for a tiny bit. And then they make their way up to Washington DC where they stay for a bit at a convent. And Ana Maria, she's quite a personality. She has, you know, she's quite gregarious, probably very particular. Um, she's very royal. <laughs> so she might, she doesn't necessarily get along with the nuns for too long. And so after, <laughs> Being in DC, they make their way up to Philadelphia and they end up remaining in Philly for, uh, well, she remains in Philly for the last 30 years of her life. And actually, she's buried in Center City at St. John the Evangelist. So you could visit the grave yourself. It's just right outside. It's located on 13th between, uh, I think, Market and Chestnut, maybe on Clover Street. It's, the church itself is, you know, kind of smaller than you'd think, and, and this grave site is very narrow and small, but you can absolutely visit it. And she's actually only one of a couple people of royal blood to be buried on U.S. soil. And she's right here in Philadelphia. So now, going, circling back to your question, Greg, about the frames, it's a great question. So these are the frames <laughs> they're in currently. These frames are, you know, relatively modern. They were made in like the 1950s, 60s when, you know, they were, these two paintings had just been requested to go on loan and they just needed something quick to send them off. And they're pretty boring. They're, they're just simple black frames with a gold strip in the inside. And what they don't really give these, these, this emperor and this empress the grandeur that they deserve. In fact, they, it really squashes the portraits. Um, it really takes away from the depth. I mean, of course, this is a poor treatment of photo and, and all the overpaint also deadens the background and really squashes these, these portraits, but the frames do not do it justice. So we're doing all this work on these paintings and trying to get them you know, for the reinstall the frames should be considered as well. Now, the question is, how do we frame them? So we have, there's, there's, we have the story of the portraits underneath. We have the portraits that we see on top, on, you know, just uh, normally. And then we have the story of what happens to these portraits after. They travel from Mexico to the, to the United States and then they're here for 30 years. So where, how do you frame them? Which time period do you frame to? If, if the paintings were reused, would the portraits, or rather if the canvases had been reused, they were assumably framed in a way, would those frames have been reused? So then do you go back to the portraits underneath and consider 
you know, the 1790 to 1800 uh, Spanish frame? Or do you think of 1822 when the coronation is taking place and maybe tastes are a bit different and things and money is maybe tighter? Or do we think about it in Philadelphia when she's here for 30 years, perhaps in her travels, was the, were the paintings kind of stowed away, not framed and then brought out? And so you're kind of like, okay, where do we go with this? And so what we ended up deciding is we don't really have a clear idea of how they would have been framed at the time of the coronation. If we look at this frame right here, I'm just circling it. It's this one with this top, uh, very ornate topper and this gold here. This is what another coronation portrait is framed in. And it was like, okay, cool. This is a great frame. It's really out, you know, it's really royal. It's really regal. There's a lot going on. But the thing is, it was actually a modern uh, fabrication. So it's not original to the coronation portrait. So we're like, okay, we don't really have any clear information at this time. So what do we do? So we're looking at uh, frames around the time that Ana Maria would have been in Philadelphia. And what we found was this portrait um, by Drexel has this wonderful frame on it, um, dating to 1824, which is relatively contemporary. It has a very nice general appeal. And what's really exciting is that there are these connections. So F.M. Drexel is the father of the Drexel who starts Drexel University, and this is in Drexel University's collection. Now, F.M. Drexel had a relatively large family. He was actually a member of St. John the Evangelist congregation. And so he and Ana Maria likely at least knew of each other. And so there's a connection there. Now, another fun connection is that if we look at these ornaments in the corner, there is actually a very a strikingly similar ornament on the burial of Augustine in Mexico City, in uh, the cathedral in Mexico City. And so there's a nice connection there as well. And this frame is gilded. So it will really just give the Eterbides just kind of this royal frame that we kind of, we want them to have. And it'll really open up the portraits. Um, yeah, this is great. I love that we've taken this story up to Philadelphia, but uh, as we know, that's not the the last of this. And I, I think we do have some comments or some questions in the Q and A that are kind of anticipating. But of course, these these, these paintings, you know, um, after Anna Maria dies, you know, they they end up changing hands a bunch of times. They mm -hmm. end up, I know from talking with you, they they ended up being stored away in a basement, sort of forgotten about for a little while. So if you could talk about your process of treating them and restoring them to their their former glory, the the work that you've been kind of doing now, um, Sarah. Absolutely, thank you. yeah. So so these are the before treatment photos of the two portraits. Now, as you mentioned, they've. As I, as I told you in another conversation, they've, they've been through a lot. And um, it's very clear through the imaging that we did just and just the examination that there's, you know, very discolored. There's a lot of overpaint masking, probably quite a significant amount of damage. Um, you can see in the x-rays and the IR images the extent of the damage. And it's, it's pretty extensive. Um, but very much worth uh, bringing them back to, you know, a clean state and, and to really show off the grandeur of the Turby days. It's worth, you know, cleaning them and treating them. So before I carry forward, I just wanted to say another thing we do is take cross sections. So we take, you know, I have this, for example, I don't know if you can see, do the makeup thing where you put your hand behind it. So I use this scalpel to take the tiniest of a sample, basically a pinhead, and we embed that sample in a resin, and then we're able to view it as if you were, you know, to you know, you cut a piece of cake and you see the layers. It's something very similar to that, but on a microscopic scale. And doing this reveals even more information than the imaging had. But I, I showed this cross section in particular because we could we could talk 
we would say many things, but just to show this one in particular is, I wanna show you that the bottom here, you have your ground and a white layer, and that's the portrait below. And then above that, there's a second ground that which I talked about a bit earlier, also red, and then the visible portrait, which is the turbidase. Now this cross section shows how thick the overpaint is. That all of that greenish kind of loop around it is all overpaint. I took this from an area of paint loss that had been restored. So you can see um, how much overpaint there really is. And it's very thick. So I'm just gonna show this, this video of me cleaning and I'm gonna talk about the cleaning process. So on top, there was a synthetic varnish which I was able to remove with a certain set of solvents that only dissolves synthetic varnish. Under that was a natural resin varnish, which I, had, which I was able to remove with a different set of solvents that can dissolve natural resin varnish. So I was able to work in layers to clean the surface. Now, even once I got it to a clean state, and here's just a during cleaning treatment uh, photo, there was so much overpaint still on the surface and you can really see it in this, this fur bib of the, of the emperor. So even here, you see, even once it's clean, it's very discolored, this, this old retouch. And in UV, which is ultraviolet light, we're able to tell and characterize that and say, yes, this is indeed overpaint, it's very extensive. Now this was a lead white oil retouch that was very difficult to remove but I was able to come up with a gel solution that was able, like a chelating agent that I was able to pick it up fairly well. But it, this whole cleaning process was fairly tedious and required a lot of thought and a lot of chemistry and <laughs> just thinking about um, what's happening on the surface. And so the bottom image here is uh, the clean state with fills added to it. So you can see that that overpaint was really hiding a lot of abrasion, but whoever did it just kind of went over all this original paint. Our goal is to get back as much of that original paint as possible and then work with that. And what ultimately happens is getting back the original, you're able to stitch it better in a more um, cohesive uh, way. So before doing anything further, we need to create a, a barrier. So we put an isolating varnish down, which both saturates and protects the original surface. And on the left here is just, I just threw in this, it's a synthetic varnish that I used and that's it um, in its solid state before I dissolved it. So that's what I'm putting on the surface. Now in terms of the retouching, the losses some of the losses are very large and some of them are very small and some of it's abrasion. But the technique I was using is basically taking paint and using these tiny brushes and these very large area of losses and going over it in single little strokes and then going over those strokes with another color and another color to optically um, match basically what's happening on the surface. So for example, here's original and then here's the loss kind of starts here and this is where I'm starting to reintegrate that loss to match closer to the original. And so again, just building up that color in a way to, make, to get there. And the goal is to not have it be solid. You kind of want it to be loose enough in these large area of losses so that your eye doesn't go to it. Um, and then it just kind of dances on the surface and is not distracting at all, but matches enough. <laughs> And so here is the before treatment. Here's the clean state and the varnish and the fill. And then this is actually kind of an older current state photo. Um, I've done actually more since this photo was taken. And then also for the emperor, the before and after, or the before and current state with the clean state in between. Great, thank you. Yeah, and, and of course you have those portraits right behind you. So we'd love to get a close up of what you're working on right now. So we're gonna switch over to that presentation camera in a minute here. So here's my tabaret. This is, that, this is the cart that holds all of my supplies that I'm working with. 
the brushes that I mentioned. Very, very fine. <laughs> the palette here, which I'm gonna have to, should have opened beforehand. <laughs> so I'm using Gamblin Conservation Colors, as well as I've mixed, pre-mixed colors just to, um, for larger areas to just quickly get that color faster. Um, of course, always being safe, we have our gloves. If I were working with dust or, or any large particles, I'd have a mask on. I also have a ventilating mask if I need for solvents. So here we are at the painting at the easel. And I'm just gonna hone in on this area right here. So as if you can recall from that um, large, uh, during the clean state photo, all of this was missing. And if you look in the before treatment, this was completely covered with just a brown mishmash of paint. And it actually terminated in a very straight way. So it kind of went like that and just completely covered. In removing that, I was able to gain back this detail here. So this is original paint here in this area. And what we see is actually there's this beadwork that kind of goes across and then this highlight here that also goes across. So prior to that, that was all missing, but we were able to regain that, which helps me um, figure out how to bring that back. So the same was true with this spot here. We were missing everything down here, but I see that this element, this ornamentation, uh, which is a quiver and arrow, the top of it was still intact. So I was able to basically take a tracing from one that's available here. Copy and kind of paste it in. Now the thing about how this artist puts these details in, they don't follow the folds. They're just kind of like stamped on, stamped on. So again here, stamp, boop, boop, boop. And you really kind of see the pattern. And in this area of loss, which I'm still working on, of course, so forgive me. I see that there's one here, here, there's one here. There's some original paint that shows me there's one here. I can tell that the pattern repeats and actually comes here. Now, another thing about this area, I mentioned that originally, whoever previously restored it just brought this cloth straight down, but there was original paint left here, which actually showed that the red started here and then the brown started and went that way. So it doesn't come straight down, it actually curves. And I was able to follow the remnants to bring that back. So here's another area that I'm working on. Large area of loss again. And again, we see an original and I'll bring that back. And this actually is the crown, which you see there and I'll take a tracing of it and see how much it copies and follows that and perhaps put it back in. And then this was another area, original, and I started bringing back in this element here, which is this. And it follows, once I did a tracing, it basically follows it exactly and it brings it down. And so not everything we do is like this large loss. As I mentioned, some of what we do is very subtle and you just have to kind of push back abrasions. So there was a ton of abrasion here, which I mentioned, which showed the ground underneath and you just kind of want to push it back so you're not noticing it. So I don't know if you guys have any questions. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of questions um, that people have already submitted. Um, I will say there was one very enterprising individual who submitted a question in advance to us over email. So I think we'll probably start with that question and hopefully that'll give other folks in the audience time to think of their own questions too, if they want. So Linnea, can you read that question that we've got in advance, please? Sure. Uh, so Diana Roberts wants to know 
whether these portraits were painted from life? So that's a really great, a really great question. And I was able to, um, I worked with Mark Castro, who was a curator here before, now he's at the Dallas Museum of Art. Um, but while he was here, we worked together on this project and, and I hope to continue working with him. And he would be the one that I would go to and like talk to about that. But in what I've looked at, when I've looked at a lot of these coronation portraits of the few that are available to us, I'm not so convinced that these were painted from life. But there's another one that I found that kind of shows Iturbide with like lesser, like he almost has like more of like a stand-in costume on and there's like a blue sash and it's, it's very different than these more kind of interpreted portraits that I, I think they are more interpreted. They're drawing much more upon Napoleon's actual portrait of him as an emperor in terms of their clothes. I think although I want to say her like her face in particular is less idealized than other portraits I've seen of her. I still think in looking at them side by side, they're just the way the artist painted them. I think there's, I'm not so convinced that they were done in person. Great, thank you. Um, we have so many great questions in the Q&A. The, the next one is, how long does the entire conservation process take? That's a great question. And I would say that's project dependent. Um, some projects, you know, are not as involved as this or not as expansive as this one. This project, I mean, yes, the portraits themselves were in a very rough original, you know, state. There's a lot of damage on these portraits. And then we also, if we think about the frames, that's another aspect of the project. Um, so this project in particular, I've been working on over the course of the last couple of years, but it's not the only project I've worked on. I've worked on several projects in the meanwhile, and so the, I'd push these on the back burner and I'd bring them back out. And then of course we had COVID and then life gets in the way. So like, <laughs> you're not working on these things one at a time, like a hundred percent. You kind of are juggling several projects at one time. Um, so again, it's, yeah, again, it's project dependent. So these of course have taken longer, but there are other projects that perhaps the paintings are, you know, in fairly good condition, but there's a little abrasion um, that just needs to be kind of toned back, or maybe there's a gloss issue, or it just is maybe a little dusty and needs a little surface cleaning. So Sarah, there are, there are two questions that basically both ask how these portraits came into the PMA's collection, how they got here. Uh, again, a great question. Um, so these are part of the Lamborn collection. Now, Lamborn uh, collects a lot of Latin American art, and he had donated, he tried donating his collection actually to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and it was there for like a little bit, his collection, but they weren't so um, keen on, on taking it in. And so that collection actually ended up coming here to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where actually it's, it's probably better off because, you know, these paintings themselves came back here. These were actually, in that initial, you know, bequest and then like sent back to Philadelphia, they were left at the Met in the basement for a little bit. So their acquisition date is a little bit later than most of the other collection. Um, so their, this acquisition date is 1922. Um, so they do come back a little later. The provenance of these two, I'm not entirely clear on. I think um, they were in Philadelphia may have been bought in a, in a sale from this, the church and then ended up in a, you know, the Lamborn's collection. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question that asks, how do you determine what works or objects get conservation treatment? Is there a rotation or do you select objects based on their condition and obvious need? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So sometimes it's dependent on what um, what the curators want, what's happening in the museum, um, what shows are going up or what galleries are being reinstalled or looked at. Um, sometimes there are paintings that have been sitting in storage and a curator, you know, happens upon it and they're like, oh my goodness, this is a very important painting. We definitely should treat this and, and have this uh, on, on display. Um, so, it depends. Sometimes there might be a treatment that, you know, a conservator is interested in and if they're here permanently over time, they might be able to work on it. So it just kind of depends. 
Thank you. Eleanor Young asks, what is your favorite artwork that you've worked on? Oh man, I, so this question always gets me because every time, I would say a conservator would all, I, I would think most agree. When you start working on something, it kind of captures your heart, even if you did not like it at first and you're like, oh, I don't know. It's, it just, it grows on you over time because you put so much effort and you're looking at it and you're thinking about it all the time. And it just, it, I think any project I've ever worked on, I'm always like, I love this. I, maybe at first I was like, oh, I don't know. And then I'm like, oh no, this is, this is incredible. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this it goes back to those hidden portraits. Um, and the question is, where did you start the search in trying to identify the subject if you discover a hidden portrait? Mm -hmm. um, so for this one in particular, so this is the first time I, I will say that I've ever had a painting, paintings that had paintings underneath them. So for me, I was like, what? this is wild. Um, these are the things you dream of in grad school. But, um, so for me, I was able to work with the curators. I was working with Mark Castro. Um, Alexander Lepman was here as a curator for a bit. And so in, in conversation with them, you know, they had certain ideas, figures were brought up, um, like uh, important political figures or like the kings or queens or whoever. And, and we were talking about all these portraits. And you just start looking at various portraits and try to hone in on, char on, on key characteristics. And, and hopefully it kind of strike something and like those who already have studied um you know Spanish art or portraiture already kind of are like oh my gosh I know exactly who that is so for me I, that's not something that I um am an expert in but in being able to work with my colleagues who do know these things we're able to kind of collaborate and come together and and figure things out great and this is the next question is is perhaps slightly related and goes back to this perhaps idea of the Goya that you, that may or may not be a Goya. Um, the question is, would you ever determine that a painting beneath that you discovered in the conservation process is more valuable and you would want to display it rather than the painting that you were originally working on? It's, <laughs> um, so, you would, so, I would, I would, I don't think this is a Goya, I'll say that, <laughs> just, just from the start. Okay. Yeah. But I will say in terms of the technique, the paintings underneath are much more, they're much better done than the paintings on top. That I can say for sure. Whether or not they're more expensive, more important, more necessary, I would say that's actually not the point. The point is these paintings have had a life. There are the portraits underneath, but there are the portraits on top too that are just as significant, if not more significant, because it's telling so much more of the story. And it's just, um, it makes it so much more unique and so much more interesting. You, I, you wouldn't ever dream of, you know, taking these off to see what's underneath. But that's why we have things like technology, like imaging, so we can see beyond what we see here. And it gives us that insight that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah, um, we have a question about overpaint. Uh, and the question is, was it the original artist who kept changing the painting that caused the overpainting? So no, so the, so the, if you recall the clean state photo, that's pretty much, you know, there's no changes on behalf, like made by the painter, the, the artist, Wadate, they're, they're, none of them are his changes. All those changes came later after someone um, what, uh, restored them. So they're very much a different person, different hand in order just to restore them. And there weren't any, there weren't any significant changes with the overpaint. Yes, there was some things were covered, some small details because they were just massive areas of loss that were covered just to, I think, facilitate a faster restoration, whoever did that in you know, the 1800s. But, it wasn't, there weren't actual changes. I have worked on paintings where there were actual changes to the original painting, which had the painting then read in a different way. This is not the case here, um, I would say. 
So that, that overpaint was really just to cover, you know, abrasion and massive losses. And it just happened to discolor over time and the varnish discolors over time. Excellent. We have so many more great questions, but Greg, how are we doing on timing? Uh, do we have time for one or two more? Yeah, we have, we have about five minutes left. I'd say one or two more questions would be great. Okay, super. Um, so the next question, Sarah, is do you ever wonder what future conservationists will think of current conservation techniques? Oh, all the time. <laughs> Perhaps it haunts my dreams at night. Um, <laughs> I mean, a lot of what conservators do today or oftentimes a conservator is redoing a past conservator's treatment, whether it failed or did it hold up or didn't hold up, or maybe it just things have changed and, you know, a material of varnish, for example, that seemed to be like the it varnish or perhaps like a, an adhesive or something that happened to be the it adhesive of the time because it was gonna, you know, stand the test of time and it was gonna age well. Perhaps it didn't, and then the folks with me today might be working to fix what's happened. Um, so yeah, so in the future, I'm sure <laughs> a conservator will be like, oh, why did they use this? And now I have to fix it. Um, so yeah, but we hope, I mean, in doing what we do, we're always trying our best to choose materials that will not affect the original that will age well, so it doesn't have to go through this process over and over again. We wanna, we wanna like, you know, give it space and respect the art as much as possible. We're really trying to limit our hand as much as we can. We don't wanna, you know, go over the deep end. We wanna really respect um, the artwork and its future, and like hopefully. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that, thank you. I guess so one final question, and this is about um, some of the technology you're using. How long did it take you to learn to make sense of information from x-rays or infrared, and how helpful is that um, compared to just removing paint? It is so helpful to have the imaging techniques we have today. You can do so much by just looking at the painting. You can see with your, you know, with trained eyes, the more you see, the more you know, of course. Um, and by just looking at something, I can tell that it's been restored or I can tell that there's a lot of overpaint or this or that. Um, but imaging or technical analysis can really help determine a treatment process and make things, certain things easier. It's also super helpful when I was able to look at it and I see, I was like, okay, I see exactly where this massive loss is in the x-ray because it just comes up, it's radio opaque and I see it. But then when I'm looking at it, I see that the restorer who treated it, he um, completely covered even more than just this little loss. So I know that I'm going to have to, I'm, there's going to be a lot more that I'm removing than what the x-ray shows. So the loss is smaller than the actual amount of damage done by the previous restorer, to be perfectly honest. Um, so it's, it's immensely helpful. And cross sections oftentimes will tell us certain things. Maybe we need to analyze the paint or um, the varnish layer and understand exactly what the formulation is because we don't wanna use some kind of solvent or chemical or anything that will remove or damage it. We wanna, ha we wanna equip ourselves with as much information as possible to be very um, conscientious in our judgments. And we really think about these things. We don't just like go to town. It's not like, okay, here's the project, clean it. That's, that's not what we do. It's very much, we really think and we digest the information and get as much as possible so we can do right by the artwork. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Thank you to Sarah, uh, thank you to Linnea, and thank everyone here for coming. Um, we just wanna thank you for participating in this event and for supporting the museum. Uh, if you enjoyed this program, um, you know, we're, we're so happy to be able to offer this for free, uh, but we do hope you also consider joining our, our membership program. Uh, you get perks like programs just for members, free admission and discounts. 
um, and member services is, is happy to help with information on that. Um, I also wanted to just say that our next public virtual program is going to be on September 22nd, um, led by Linnea, who you've met today, um, on Mary Cassatt. And this is going to be her in conversation with curator Jenny Thompson um, on uh, her work in relation to the women's suffrage movement. And we're going to connect that to a voting today and, and, and talk more about how to register to vote. Um, in the upcoming election. So very important, uh, especially as we celebrate the centenary of women's suffrage. Um, so when you, when we end today, you'll get a pop-up that has a survey for you if you want to complete that. We'd love your feedback since this is brand new to us. Um, and we, we asked for that feedback by um, this m upcoming Monday. Um, if you can, and we also will send out a recording of this video in case you missed part or you want to watch, if you just want to watch the whole thing again, that'll come in that follow up email. So um, thank you again. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Linnea. Um, thank you, everyone. And um, hope you have a good afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you so much.